Facebook. And welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Audra and I work at the McKinley Memorial Library. With us tonight is Rebecca Nags, who serves as a park guide at the First Ladies National Historic Site in Canton, Ohio. As a park guide, Rebecca works with the public through programming, house tours, which we're going to be doing tonight, educational programming for students, and community outreach, which we're also doing tonight. First Ladies, um, the First Ladies National Historical Site is the third national park detail Rebecca has had, along with the William Howard Taft National Historical Site and the James A. Garfield National Historical Site. So lots of presidential uh, history in her resume. Uh, outside of work, Rebecca exercises her passion for historic preservation through various organizations in her hometown of Medina, Ohio. So thank you so much for being here tonight, Rebecca, and I will turn it over to you. Oh, but first, everyone, if you have questions, please feel free to put them in the chat or if you're on Facebook, just comment on this post. We will be addressing them throughout and also at the end. Okay, ready to go. Thank you, Rebecca. Of course, well, good evening and um, thank you folks for having me on this, well, lovely International Women's Day, a great day to celebrate First Ladies, just like we were talking about before. Um, to get us kicked off, I wanna talk a little bit about kind of the layout of the site. So if you folks come to visit us, we are located right in the heart of downtown Canton, Ohio. And there we go. So in downtown, we have two different buildings. We have the Education Center, which is home to um, all of our different rotating museum exhibits. Um, we work in conjunction with the National First Ladies Library who curates those exhibits at the site. Um, they tend to do on average about two sets of exhibits a year. So even if you come multiple times in a year, you may have completely different experiences when you come to visit the park. So we have three different exhibit rooms as well as a historic theater where we show um, a documentary series. You can see some pictures of the theater here. And then on site, we offer a variety of programming. Um, right now, just with COVID restrictions, the main on site activity that we have besides house tours is junior ranger programs. So if you or a loved one has a junior ranger, or I always say anyone can be a junior ranger, and you wanna learn more about first ladies, um, you can always come down and earn your junior ranger badge, which you can get at any national park that you go to as well. So it's a fun sort of collector item at all the different park sites. And then today, we are specifically going to do a virtual house tour of the Saxton home. So this is going to be the birthplace and family home of Ida Saxton McKinley. And she of course is going to be the wife and acting first lady to 25th President William McKinley. Um, so as we go through the house today, um, if you have any McKinley questions, I can kind of do my best to answer those, but this really is a more Ida centric tour. And we're really gonna talk about sort of her experiences and how they helped her to um, sort of later fulfill that role of first lady of the United States. So we'll do our little walk up to the front porch here and into the main foyer. Um, so in the foyer of the house, right, um, if we were to go back in time and pretend like we were visiting the Saxton family, right, had you come by uh, foot, you would have walked through the front door just like we did here. Or perhaps if you came by horse carriage, you would have come through the side carriage door, which is the little door kind of tucked back here down the hallway. Um, you would have been greeted here in the main foyer by um, Ida as a younger girl. She was born here in the home in 1847. Um, she lived here with her two siblings, Mary and her younger brother, George, um, as well as with her parents and her grandparents. So her mother and her grandmother would have also served as hostesses here in the house. So they would have greeted you. And then the first couple rooms that we're going to head into today um, are really going to be some of the more private family spaces, and then we'll get to some of the more public spaces. Um, again, talking about Ida, just to give you some of those dates to keep in mind as we go through. So I mentioned that Ida was born in the home in 1847. Her and McKinley got married in 1871, and then she served as first lady from 1897 to 1901. Now I mentioned the main foyer, right? This uh, grand staircase does go all the way up through all three floors of the home that we're gonna 
explore today. So that just gives you sort of another angle of that four-year space. And as I mentioned, we're gonna start in, in essence, what would be on the left-hand side of the house, which is all of those more private family quarters. So spaces that Ida and her loved ones would have experienced, but we as guests to the home would not have necessarily seen in this time period. The first room to start off is going to be the family parlor. So much like our family rooms or living rooms, right? This is a space where everybody gets to spend time together um, including the kids. So Ida and her siblings could run around and play parlor games, you know, cards, marbles, different things like that. And in this space, we also can kind of put some more names and faces together. So the gentleman's portrait there above the fireplace, um, that's Ida's father, James Saxton. And then we also have this oval portrait. So this is going to be a picture of Ida's mother, Catherine DeWalt Saxton. Um, so the DeWalt family and the Saxton family are both going to be considered um, sort of founding families in the Canton area. And so when the two of them married, James Saxton was able to found the Stark County Bank in town. And so that would have led to a pretty comfortable lifestyle for Ida and her siblings, as well as the, a lot of the details that we're going to see in the home today. In this photograph, you can see there's a picture within a picture. The historic photograph on the easel kind of shows how large of a space the family parlor used to be. Um, in the home, we do have an elevator that takes up a little bit of the space. Um, and it does naturally lend itself into the family library as we kind of step through the doorway here. The Saxons really valued education um, for themselves and for the children. So not just George, right, as a gentleman of that period, but Ida and Mary also received college degrees. Um, Ida, as the eldest daughter, took some additional courses in mathematics, and she had a job as a bank teller for quite a few years. Um, she worked with her father at the family bank. Um, and so that makes Ida an example of what we call a working first lady. So um, a woman or a first lady who had like a career or a job or an aspiration prior to marrying their husband and subsequently moving to the White House. Now with the different education in the home, that of course is going to lead to all kinds of discussions. Um, the books that we see here, of course are going to be not exactly the same, but a lot of the types of titles and authors that the families would have read. Um, in the case of the Saxton family, right? Um, you think about contemporary issues, right? Things that the family might've talked about at the dinner table. Um, Ida grew up as a teenager during the Civil War, and so her father was very involved in um, the sort of more staunch abolitionist groups that were popular in Northeast Ohio at the time. Um, her mother was also very involved in a lot of the women's rights organizations that were taking place. So not sort of the suffrage like we think of at the turn of the century, um, but women's groups that would have been responsible for things like the Women's Property Law Act in 1840, these smaller steps that we take to get to suffrage at the turn of the century. This is another view of that library space with a nice family photo on the wall. Um, the sort of role of women in the house is continued through the generations of the family. Um, the Saxton house is only ever gifted to another daughter. So we see the house go from Ida's grandmother to Ida's mother. And then the decision is ultimately made to leave the house to Ida's sister, Mary. And that's just because she is the biggest family. If you folks look in the bookcase here on the bookcase here on the right, the sort of one, two, three, fourth shelf down, there's a big group photo of what would be Ida's nieces and nephews. So these are the seven kids that would have also all grown up here in the home um, after Ida and her siblings did. Get another view here of the library. And then we'll switch on into the dining room. So the next spaces that we're gonna see, the dining room, breakfast room, and prep kitchen, they're again still gonna be family spaces here in the home. So dinner time in Ida's life was a much more formal affair. We think of like our Sunday family dinners or perhaps Thanksgivings, right? It was a much more formal expectation for um, Ida and her sisters and the family growing up. Um, when Mary's kids start to live here in the home, they can benefit from a space like the prep, uh, 
the breakfast room, right? You have almost like a built-in kids table in the house. So they don't have to all sit at the formal table together, um, but you do have these specifically designated spaces. This is sort of the other sort of tucked far corner of the dining room, again, with the buffets and servers. And then we have the prep kitchen. So the prep kitchen is one of two kitchen spaces the family originally had in the house. Um, the main cooking kitchen was originally located in the basement of the home, which unfortunately has not been redone, but it's where a lot of the heavy cooking would have been done, that heavy hearth and things like that. The prep kitchen is great then because it's where you can cook a lot of the lighter fare. So you may notice the sort of biscuit press that's on the table here, all the other sort of baked goods and teas, right? It's easier to cook things like that on low heat on say a wood burning stove like the Glenwood here in this photo. And then this house did not have a butler's pantry. So the prep kitchen would have also served as a space for food storage, as well as a space to store dishes and crystal and things like that. So on the left-hand side here, you can see there's a, what I call a double chest ice box. And then and it, another example of a display hutch for glassware and things of that nature. Now the presence of these spaces, of course, would imply a presence of staff here in the Saxton home. Um, Ida references in her diaries anywhere from about two to six people working in the home, depending on the event that might be going on. Um, but they weren't much different than myself. You know, I go to the house, I do my job, and I go home <laughs> at the end of the day. And so a lot of the people that worked for the family ha had a similar situation. Um, the only folks that are ever mentioned in the census records uh, are going to be the nannies. So the handful of those that they had over the years would have lived in the home and been close to the children. Now, I know that's a lot of family quarters to see all at one time. So before we continue on to our next space, did we have any sort of initial questions? Okay, I'm not seeing anything in the chat right now, um, but I will let you know if that changes. I am a little curious myself. I noticed that the wallpaper looks very ornate. Is it is it gilt? Yes, you know? so the, the paper, are you mean like gilded or gilt as yes. like a designer? Okay, so yeah, the paper here in the foyer does have some gilding to it. Um, the foyer paper is actually a, a William Morris design. So the sort of restoration in the house reflects basically 1870 when the house was expanded to its current size um, all the way up until 1890. And William Morris was a really popular um, wallpaper designer of that time period. So he um, not only would create gilded papers like the ones we see here, but his whole sort of motif preference was, in, was to bring designs of nature into the home. So this has chrysanthemums and tulips. And I know it's kind of hard to see from far away, but all of these different like natural designs to kind of emphasize the natural beauty of the outside world in your home as well. Thank you. Yeah, of okay. course. All right. So to get into some of the more public spaces, right? So if we pretend that we're guests in the house, right? Again, we wouldn't have seen anything that was on the left. We more than likely would have been escorted directly into our next room, which was the formal parlor here in the Saxton home. Now, formal parlors of this time period are really a great way to show off kind of the wealth and the status to whoever visited your home, be it the, you know, uh, co-workers, family, friends, loved ones, you name it. And so the Saxtons kind of show off that, that wealth through a variety of details in this space. You may have noticed all the arched windowways and doorways that we've seen so far in the home. The floor to ceiling windows, right, that kind of expense that comes with the plated glass. Um, the black walnut wood that was used in the home. And then in the case of the formal parlor, the very intricate wallpaper plan. Um, this room, when you count all the different details, the alternating medallions on the chair rail, all the way up to the dealings, different ceiling papers, there are 22 different prints. Um, it kind of all blends together fairly nicely. It's not too distracting, but it again just kind of shows off that wealth and status in the home. Now, growing up here in the house, um, Ida 
right? She has the benefit of a college education, but she's still a lady of this time period. And so she would have been expected to attend finishing schools and done etiquette courses. And one of the sort of roles for a lady of the household was to be able to provide entertainment for their guests. So Ida's instrument of choice was the piano. And so the one that we have in the home on display is one of two. Um, its matching sister companion is on display at the um, McKinley Presidential Library, which is also in Canton. Two other original pieces for this space include the portrait here above the fireplace, as well as the music box. As I'll call it a culmination of Ida's um, efforts in school, um, college, and beyond. You have um, her and her sister Mary uh, going on a grand tour through Europe in 1869. And so for folks that may not be familiar with the grand tour, it was an opportunity for sort of young Victorian folks to go and explore all of the places that they had read about in their educational studies growing up. Now, this is going to be different than what we might think of today, you know, kids backpacking across Europe and, you know, staying in hostels and things like that. These were much more formal, um, especially when the ladies were traveling, they would often go in groups and they would be attended by chaperones, um, but it still gave them the opportunity to go and see um, all the places they had learned and studied. And so as a thank you gift to their parents, the girls purchased the music box here in the case in Geneva, Switzerland and had it sent back to the home. I also point out the picture of Ida here above the fireplace because um, this is oftentimes referred to as her sort of like her engagement portrait or like a debutante portrait. Um, when Ida comes back from Europe in 1870, um, she's going to be labeled as the Belle of Canton. She's kind of the most sought out bachelorette in town. She's been on the social scene for a while. She's 23 at this point. Um, and within that same year that she comes back from Europe is when her and McKinley start to hit it off. So oftentimes that's why this portrait gets designated the engagement portrait, because um, her and McKinley do get married just that next January in 1871. Now I'm going to sort of transition us. We're going to pretend like we're walking all the way up the stairs to the third floor. And so while I switch slides here, I'll just check again to make sure we don't have any questions. That's right, I'm not seeing anything. All right, not a problem. Now the third floor of the home does require a little bit of imagination. So if we look here in the design, this map, you can see that the staircase, you'd come straight out into what used to be this really grand ballroom. So Market Avenue, is right here and the ballroom would have encompassed the whole width of the house. Um, so it would have been originally a very grand open space. Um, in this ballroom is where Ida would have had some of her initial courtship experiences with William, um, but the most significant event that took place in this space was their wedding reception. Um, Ida and William were married at the Presbyterian Church, which is a historic church just around the corner from us in Canton. Um, the Presbyterian Church was where Ida's family had attended, and there's a very large Methodist church right next door to it where the McKinleys attended. So after Ida got married, she jumped ship to the, um, to the Presbyterians, but the wedding reception was held here in the home with family and close friends. Now, the, two, the couple originally started their married life in a different house here in Canton. So this is a photograph that you, some of you folks may recognize. Um, often the caption with, a pic with, with this picture is the campaign home or the home of the front porch campaign. Um, at this point in our story, it, this house was gifted to Ida and William by her father, and it's where the couple is going to start their married life together. So from 18, January of 1871 to when McKinley takes Congress in 1877, um, he will go from serving in his own law firm in Canton to the county prosecutor at the courthouse, which is also around the corner from us in Canton. Lots of things within walking distance. And Ida and William are gonna kick off their married life in this home. Um, initially, the family is going to be blessed with two daughters. 
Um, but both of them do unfortunately pass quite young. Um, the younger McKinley daughter was named Ida. Um, she was born premature, and so she only lived to be about three months old. Their older daughter, Katie McKinley, lived to be about four, four and a half years old. And so she passes away of either scarlet fever or cholera, kind of depending on which records you're reading. And to sort of add insult to injury, during this six-year time period, Ida also loses both of her grandparents as well as her own mother. So by the time that the McKinleys are looking to take Washington, um, Ida doesn't have a lot of great memories associated with this house, and so she doesn't necessarily want to live here alone while McKinley goes for the congressional season. So her sister does offer to convert this third floor ballroom into kind of like an apartment for her and McKinley. So the space, the direction that we're facing in right now, you can kind of imagine a nice sitting area and a small entertainment space. There would have been a smaller sort of set off um, sleeping room for the two of them. And then this is a, a sort of slow video here to get us the full scope of the space. So that door is where the stairs come out. And then McKinley does establish a private study, which is another space that we've restored here in the home. Now, in the study, right, um, we were fortunate enough to have some of McKinley's um, belongings donated back to us by the Presidential Library. So you can see an original campaign poster there on the far wall. Um, it's a, a sort of 18, would be 1896 poster. So it's McKinley between his top two ladies, right, his wife and his mother. And then you're also going to have many of the uh, the law texts and the smaller writing desk here in front is also an original piece. Um, this was gifted to McKinley by his mother when he became an attorney. And so it's actually considered one of the most traveled pieces in the home. It was in every office that he held from law clerk to president. I like to say as well, um, when it comes to the study and McKinley's political career, Ida is quite literally always by McKinley's side. As we can see here in this photo, um, this is a, a campaign image from um, 1896. Um, Ida is quite literally right by McKinley's left-hand side there. Um, but even during the earlier years in his um, political career, right, McKinley will serve in Congress, he'll serve as governor of Ohio in 1891 and 93, and then he'll be given that nomination for the presidency. Um, they are really more of like a power, political power couple. Um, Ida's father and the family wealth really contributes to a lot of McKinley's campaign success. Um, her own education and upbringing will also make her a great conversationalist. She'll often edit McKinley's speeches for him um, and she really just serves as an all-around great political confidant during that time. I'll give you sort of a little timeline again here of McKinley's political climb. We'll see his years in Congress, his time as governor, and then again, the years with the presidency. Um, in 1896, during the campaign, right, um, there's going to be a lot of public discussion surrounding Ida's health as well. Um, the White House doctors will eventually end up diagnosing Ida with epilepsy. Um, she had serious bouts of seizures, um, a lot of just fatigue that was subsequent to those. And we assume that she had some neurological damage because she lost a lot of the mobility in her right leg. And so during the campaign time, there was quite a public stir about if, you know, Ida could really fulfill the role of first lady if she would become a hindrance on McKinley as a political leader. And so the way that the Republican Party kind of squashes that in this time period is they actually publish a campaign biography about Ida. So she's not only the first first lady to have a campaign biography, but she's really the first person to ever have one written who just wasn't one of the candidates in question, let alone a woman for that time period. So it's a really great um, resource that gives us insight into who she is and the sort of relationship that her and McKinley both have. Whenever we take people into McKinley's study, there's also these questions about the funky little doors in the home. Um, 
the doors in this room are all original. The one that kind of sits above the floor there um, is access to the attic that's still above in the house that has not been preserved, but we still have in the home. The door that's there on the left actually is just a closet space. So it sits directly behind the spiral staircase. And it's not like our fancy walk-in closets like we think of today. Um, oftentimes closets in this time period just had built-in dressers in them so that you could store clothes folded or flat. And that's exactly the same thing that this closet has. Now, when we think about Ida's health and, you know, having to take on the White House, right? There's a lot of roles and responsibilities that fall on a first lady. Um, a first lady is expected to be the White House hostess. They're expected to be a political confidant to their spouse. They're expected to be one of the most active socialites in Washington. They're supposed to take on a cause that's bigger and grander than themselves. And of course, none of these things are actually written down, right? There's no rule about what a first lady must and mustn't do, but just different years and generations of expectations that pre uh, previous first ladies have bestowed upon them. Now, in some instances, first ladies have hurdles to overcome. If we think about Ida's health and the epilepsy that she had, um, she's going to not only be competing against sort of prior expectations. We think about Grover Cleveland's young wife. He married her in the White House. She's in her mid-20s, you know, probably one of the most active socialites in Washington. And then you have Ida coming into the picture. She's a little bit older. She's suffering with illness, and she's being treated by the White House doctors with the best medicine available at the time. But what we know today, she was basically being sedated to try to reduce the amount of seizures that she would experience. So when you consider all of those factors, you know, we think about sort of the long history of First Ladies and how they rank. I always like to put Ida right in the middle because she, um, I guess not in the middle, more of like in the seven, eight category, because she's, although she's not talked about necessarily as often as say Eleanor Roosevelt right here on our scale, um, she overcomes so many obstacles and she's still able to have such a successful time in the White House. Um, now, if you're not Ida and you think about the other women, right, we think about all of the expectations. And sometimes it's just a matter of mind over matter. Somebody like Eleanor Roosevelt goes above and beyond, not only during the administration, but after, to kind of create a precedent of what it means to be a first lady. Meanwhile, on the other end of the spectrum here, this is a, um, a drawing of Jane Pierce. Um, she absolutely did not want to move to Washington. She did not want to become first lady of the United States. She moved into the White House, but basically only because she absolutely had to. Um, and she truly just did not fulfill that sort of spirit that we think about of what it means to be a first lady today, but with good cause, right? She had no say in this job that her husband had now just been voted into, right? It wasn't her choice for her husband to become president. Um, she had a family and a private life that she wanted to keep private, you know, being president isn't always the most exciting thing in the world. Um, so if you folks don't mind, I'm just curious, where do you think you would fall on the first lady scale? Do you mind maybe throwing in the chat um, where you think you would want to fall? If you think it'd be, you'd be the next Eleanor Roosevelt, or perhaps you'd want to be more like Jane Pearson, keep a more private life to yourself. Well, that's a pretty tall order as people are answering. I don't know if you could stay, keep a private <laughs> life nowadays if you were a public figure. That's on social media. That's tough. Mm -hmm. I think, yes, yeah, social media, the news, you know, we, we'll talk later on as well, but even Ida has a hard time staying away from the press um, with McKinley's death and everything. You know, by the time 1901 rolls around, I'd argue that she's one of the most famous women in America. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. If there's an appetite for something, <laughs> people will feed it. Okay. And I don't know if maybe any people on Facebook, if they're throwing numbers in too at all. Um, no, I guess no one wants to take a stab at it. Uh, I will say I would probably be more of a Jane Pierce. I would want to keep my, my life private. 
I'll, I'll give you that. <laughs> I go back and forth. Sometimes I think I'd like to think I'd fall more in the middle. Um, I think I think Jackie Kennedy is a perfect example of somebody who understood the power of the press, but also how to keep a private life private. You know, she didn't want her children to necessarily always be photographed or be in the news and things like that. So I always like to use her as a good neutral where she understood the power that the press had, but also how um, how difficult it could be as well. So thank you for sharing. Yeah, well, thank you. I'm curious to find out where Ida falls. Well, and again, in, the, in a scale like this, like I said, I always give her about an eight um, just because of all the the limitations that she had. Um, again, I would open it up to what everybody else thinks as well. So perhaps we'll, maybe we'll get some numbers here in a little while or towards the end. We shall see. <laughs> now, again, we kind of talk about Ida and William as this sort of dynamic power duo. Um, during their White House years, we're going to see not only some physical changes, um, accommodations to the White House, right, so that the couple can be close together, um, but we also see quite a few social changes that occur. Um, one of my favorite stories is during the, what would we would consider like the social season of um, 1898, um, the couple decide to implement into the state dining room of the White House um, a new tradition. Um, so what was expected at that time was that a host and hostess would sit at opposite ends of the table from one another. And, you know, that way all the gentlemen could flock to McKinley and they could have all these political conversations. And then the women would sit on the other end and, you know, discuss what was the news about the town. And in my opinion, all the important news at the other end of the table. And that was the way the things had sort of been throughout many administrations prior to the McKinleys. However, when you think about this, the grandeur of the dining room, right, being that many tables away from a loved one that is ill or could fall ill at any moment, um, the two of them decide that they kind of want to shake things up. And you'll notice in the photograph here on the right hand side that Ida is actually seated directly next to McKinley. Um, so the couple sit next to each other, which means everybody else that came together have to sit next to the, each other in that regard as well. And now we all have to engage in mixed conversation with each other. I know it's quite the scandal for 1898. Um, and by today's standards, right, it seems like no big deal, but it was a pretty hot topic in the press. You know, are the McKinleys, you know, ruining a hundred years of White House traditions or are they like a modern Gilded Age couple, right? Bringing new life and ideas to the White House. So I'll let you folks kind of take a guess as to what you think the solution was there. And then we do have one more floor here in the home. So if we go down just one section to the second floor of the house, um, we kind of skipped around. We went from the first floor up to the, main, the top level. And if we go back down to the second floor, this is going to be kind of the main living quarters. Um, so before I get into some of the bedroom spaces, I think there may be a chat question here? Yes. Um, someone would like to know, did Ida ever have seizures in public? That's an excellent question. Yes. So there are, um, to my understanding, a couple different newspaper accounts that reference um, Ida having a public seizure. Um, one of the newspapers, because her and William had rearranged things, um, in some instances, the two of them would just like leave the dining room. Like if she felt like, oh, I don't feel good, or I kind of feel like the onset of a seizure, they might be able to excuse themselves, which in its own right came with, you know, social taboo and discussion. Um, but there are one or two instances that I've read where they don't leave the table quick enough. And so McKinley almost kind of covers her with a napkin as a way to sort of, sort of cover her privately. Um, obviously, it's not a perfect solution, but it's sort of better than the alternative at the time. That must have been difficult. You know, people with disabilities weren't exactly embraced back then. 
Mm-hmm. So I would imagine it would take some, would have taken some courage on her part, even to, to go into a public setting. I yeah, think that so says something about her character. Very much so. And I think the other factor too, is, you know, the White House doctors, although it seems a bit intense for us to think about these sort of sedation methods. If she had been anybody else, right, not the first lady of the land and treated by a regular doctor, she more than likely would have just been diagnosed as manic or what they called a disease of the mind and, you know, would have been more than likely separated from McKinley. So although it's not the best of circumstances, it's much better than what could have potentially been the alternative for her in a different setting. All right. So we'll sort of pretend like we're in our second floor setting here. So again, here in the Saxton home, um, the house sleeps up to about 13 people at a time. So we've got all kinds of spaces for not only Ida and her sister when they're growing up, but as Mary's kids grow older, right, they would have had bedrooms here in the home. And here in the house, the sort of following spaces that I'm going to show you, um, they are originally bedroom spaces, but they have been redone to reflect a different space. Um, so as you folks may remember from your history books, um, Mc the McKinleys do take a full term in the presidency. McKinley wins his second campaign in 1900, and then as a celebration, um, the two of them do go on a train tour to sell, sort of celebrate and meet the American public. Um, while Ida and William are on this train tour, they go from Washington all the way down the East Coast throughout many of the southern states. They dip down into Mexico for a short bit, and they make it all the way out to California. Um, Ida, unfortunately, does fall quite ill in California, and so they cut their itinerary there to about two to three days. And they take Ida directly back to Ohio, to the Saxton home, where she can rest and recuperate. Um, this then delays McKinley's um, arrival at the Pan American Exposition in Buffalo by about three weeks. And as you folks may remember, it's while McKinley is at the um, exposition that he is assassinated. Now, because Ida was in Canton, um, the two of them basically were reunited together in Washington. Um, and if McKinley's doctors had probably left well enough alone, there's evidence now that suggests that perhaps he would have survived. It wasn't the actual bullet that killed McKinley, but rather the infection that he suffered from the doctors that ultimately led to an infection and then subsequent heart failure. Ida now, of course, has more choices that she has to make. Does she want to leave Washington and go back to a, basically an empty campaign home where her and McKinley had intended to retire to together, or does she wanna come back to the Saxton home? Now, a lot of the evidence would make us think the Saxton home just because she wanted to be close to her family and she had this dedicated space, but that bedroom is a third floor walk up, right? Her sister has all these kids running around the house. And so she ultimately decides to go back to the campaign home and she's attended to by two nurses that she became very close with while living in the White House. And this home is just down, it used to be just down the street from us in, on market. So um, the house would have been a short carriage ride or a brisk walk, right? Just straight back to uh, the family home. And so what we were able to recreate with a lot of the primary sources, so you folks can see like the photographs that we have here. Um, but I mentioned that Ida is going to be such a popular figure after her husband's death, right? She's probably one of the most popular women in America. Everybody wants to know where she's going. How is she coping? You know, who is she wearing, right? All these things like our modern first ladies, they are still celebrities even today. And so, the spaces that we have recreated for you are examples of sort of their bedroom spaces. And I will touch on this as well. Um, when Ida is living in the White House, um, we sort of talk about 
all of these things that make her a proper first lady, right? So she she checks off most of the boxes, right? She was the political confidant. Um, she's active in the community in Canton and in Washington. But because of her physical health, right, it's a bit more difficult for her to say work a room as a hostess of the White House or go to every social event. And so that does impact her first lady cause, right? We think of our more modern first ladies, they take on these projects or passions that and require them to get out into the Washington community. And so for Ida, because she, in essence, is forced to take it easy, um, she chooses to use her skills of crochet to make a difference. So the slippers that you see in the middle of the slide here um, are a, a photograph of a hand crocheted pair of slippers done by Ida. And they're one of what she estimated to be about 3,000 pairs that she made while living in Washington. And a lot of these were donated to veterans, homeless shelters, um, hospitals, orphanages, right? And they vary in size. And then there are some instances like the ones that we have on display, you can see them in the right uh, curio cabinet here. Um, they were auctioned off to serve as a fundraising effort for um, various you know, health awareness groups in Washington, women's rights organizations that Ida was passionate about. Um, and so there are some that still exist and that's an example of how the one that we have in our collection. I mentioned the campaign home, right? Ida decides to move back to this space. Um, unfortunately, the campaign home is torn down after the World War, so it does not still stand in Canton. Um, it's where the Stark County Library sits today, just down the street from us on Market. And then as I mentioned, we have these recreated rooms. So this bedroom has been turned into a recreation of what would be considered Ida's sitting room in the Saxton home. Um, so again, we have some seating areas for her. And then I do have the photo of the painting here on the left. Um, this is a painting of Katie McKinley. So the older McKinley daughter that lived to be about four, four and a half. Um, this painting did go just about everywhere with Ida. So it was in every home, apartment, and place that um, Ida and William lived together. This is sort of a continuation of that sitting room space. And we also have this recreation of Ida's bedroom, right? So when she comes back to the home, she takes a smaller bedroom, not the same one that her and McKinley would have used together. Um, and it's set up in a way that's much more accommodating to her health. Um, you know, a rocker and her vanity are within short walking distance. She has a bedside table, you know, much more of an accessible space for her in what would in essence become these twilight years of her life. Um, she outlived her husband another six years. She didn't pass until 1907. So some more details. And then today, if you go over to the McKinley Presidential Library, there is the memorial here in the photograph. Um, Ida and William and the girls are all entombed together in the monument. So. Um, if you folks do decide to come to Canton, you can come and visit sort of the space where they live. And then you can also um, sort of pay your respects to the family at the monument in Canton as well. And so here's just a little bit of the how to find more information. Um, if you have any questions that we don't discuss in the end of our time today, you can feel free to drop us an email. Um, on our park website, we do have a video tour of the Saxton House. So if you wanna learn or you don't quite remember exactly what I said about a certain room, you can always check out that video. Um, we also have a nice photo gallery of pictures if you wanna get up and close with different artifacts and things like that as well. Okay, and as a reminder, we did also record this program. So if you wanna watch this one again um, and rejoin Rebecca, um, it will be on our YouTube channel and it will also be on our Facebook page. Okay, and Victoria says, thank you so much. Thank you, Victoria, and everyone else for joining us. Uh, we really appreciate it, and we hope you had a good, as good a time as we did. Uh, if anyone has any questions, now is the time to put them in there. Uh, okay, Renee says, thank you as well. We appreciate you two for coming out, sort of, <laughs> virtually. <laughs>
So I am a little bit curious. You mentioned, um, Rebecca, the restoration a couple of times. So do you know, uh, I guess, how they decided what, how to restore the different parts, like which time periods to go with? So yes and no. So um, one part of the presentation that I don't quite have is the, the sort of the what happens next. So the family will continue to own the home until about the mid 1920s. Um, Mary will will the house to um, her second eldest daughter, also named Katie. It's a family name. So we go from um, Mary, Mary Saxton. She marries Marshall Barber. Um, so then it's Katie Barber, right, who inherits the home. And then when she is thinking about giving the house to one of her children, um, none of them really want the house. <laughs> By the mid 1920s, um, Canton had become more electrified and the house was not updated. So it was still running on gaslight. There was still really no running water in the home aside from the cistern that fed the kitchen spaces. And the idea of the multi-generational home was just starting to become less popular, right? The single family home was more achievable for wealthy families. And so since Katie was one of Mary's seven kids and in essence, the only heir, the only heirs of the family fortune, right? The McKinley daughters both pass and then George never has any children. They decide to sell the home and split the profits. So the house goes through quite the changes over the years. Um, for about the next 60 years, the home gets converted into a split-use multi-rental property in Canton. Um, so it's a bar for a really long time. Uh, there's a cafe put in at one point. You have all these instances of like department stores. And then on the third and second floors of the house, you also end up with boarding house spaces. So all of those bedrooms get locks put on them so that each of them can become individual rooms for rent. It's just all kinds of craziness going on in the house. And so by the time that the 80s roll around, um, there had just been so much wear and tear on the home that the city of Canton, in essence, wanted the whole lot demolished. Um, thankfully, there was an outcry from sort of the extended family that still lived in the Canton area. And so they purchased the home, they restored the outside. So some of the exterior restoration was just by choice of sort of the people involved with that in the night, what would be 1980s. And um, they have the house designated on the National Register in 1987. Uh, but the inside is still a mess. So they continue to rent out the home um, well into the 90s. And that's when you have quite a few nonprofits um, taking advantage of the space. So the Canton Foundation is in the house for a while. And then our park partner, the National First Ladies Library, they will also become a, a sort of a proprietor of the house. And when they realized the significance that the house had to not only McKinley, but to, a, to Ida as a first lady, um, they decide to go all in and they're the ones responsible for a lot of the restoration efforts in the home. Um, they hold three different uh, multi-million dollar capital campaigns to raise the money to restore the house. Um, so they have a variety of historians and different you know, experts contracted to help redo the home. Um, the house is reopened to the public in 1998. A uh, former First Lady Rosalind Carter comes to Canton for the ribbon cutting. It's quite the to-do in Canton. And then the site is not designated a unit of the National Park Service until 2000. So we're kind of a baby national park in that regard. Okay. Well, thank you. It was really interesting. I, I always love to um, hear the history behind the history, sort of. <laughs> yeah, of course. So. Okay, um, well, I think that about wraps it up. I'm not seeing any more questions. So I will thank you again so much for joining us. Um, everyone, I hope you get a chance to visit, I hope I get a chance to visit the um, Saxon house at some point in the future. Uh, as um, Rebecca said, you could also see the memorial and the um, presidential, his presidential library. Um, in Niles, we have our public library and the birthplace memorial and the McKinley birthplace home 
Leather McKinley sites include, um, there are some, some things in Poland that you can see because McKinley did move to Poland um, after he lived in Niles, but before he moved to Canton. So there's lots of history out there still to see, but we thank you so much for joining us tonight and we hope to see you again in person soon. So I will sign off. Rebecca, do you have anything else to add? Uh, thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much for joining us. We had I had a great time. I'm sure everyone else did too. Okay, bye.